wanna hear far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I Friends, while on a casual drive one afternoon recently, I was arrested by two bumper stickers on the, on the white pickup truck in front of me. One big bumper sticker was the famous phrase that's on the American currency. It read, in God we trust. However, on the second bumper sticker on the same truck was from the National Rifle Association, and it read, stand and fight. Rather than attempting to reconcile the political ideologies behind these two statements, I zeroed in on the theological tension that these two polar opposite statements present. 
Friends, tonight, before we judge this man too quickly, I and most of the people I pastor and those I know live between these two warring tensions, especially when we've been wrong, betrayed, or treated unfairly. We battle between forgiveness and revenge, trusting God and telling God, I got this one. We boldly proclaim I'm hood and holy, and most of the time, hood wins. Our prayer hymn is, Father, I stretch my hand to thee, and our war cry is, Nuck if you buck. <laughs> Friends, tonight, the American culture is addicted to revenge culture. Revenge is in the music we listen to. It's in the movies we watch. It's in the social media posts that we overdose on daily. Revenge is in our politics. Presidents will run on slogans like make America great again, a.k.a. make a don't let black and brown people get outnumber us because we may do to them what they've done to us. But Jesus tonight presents to us from the first word the model of victory over the destructive addiction to revenge towards our enemies. Friends, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus captures the first recorded words while hanging on the cross. A prayer of forgiveness for his enemies. In fact, by the time we read this, the word of forgiveness from Jesus, Jesus has already experienced the betrayal by a friend. The trials are over and there is no chance for any more appeals. The wood has been cut. The blacksmith has fired and sharpened the nails. The walk of shame is completed. And the Jewish system of prudence has failed to relieve Jesus of crucifixion. Jesus now stands convicted and crucified. And undoubtedly the crowd is awaiting Jesus' first words. Perhaps he will turn over another table. Perhaps he will respond in vengeance. Look at Jesus, this dying innocent man. Rather than uttering the first words of cursing, he utters the words of blessings. Father, forgive them. And I want to tell you tonight that the prerequisite to completion is forgiveness. Did you hear what I said? That completing your assignment means starting with forgiveness. Father, Father, forgive them. I don't have but six more minutes left. Can I just deal with two words in this? First, it's the word Father. Let the church shout Father. Friends, tonight Jesus understands that even Jesus cannot handle the difficulty of forgiveness without the help of the Father. And so Jesus pulls back the robe of his divinity and allows us to see a brief minute of his humanity. And he says, God, this is too hard to forgive people that I've helped and now they've turned their backs on me. And so he prays from the cross just like he has taught us to pray in Luke chapter six. When you pray, pray our father because he knows it will be his father that will help him to handle what he has to handle. Y'all, I was in the gym the other day, Pastor T, watching one of my young people play basketball with their father. The little boy is about three. He couldn't get the ball to the rim. And I kept watching. The, ball, the boy was frustrated, kept trying to get the ball at the rim, finally like a good daddy. His, he picked his son up. He gave, put the ball in his son's hand, and the boy was able to make a shot because his daddy helped him to reach what he couldn't reach on his own. I'm saying tonight you can reach the high level of forgiveness when you get, got help from the Father. I got one more thing to tell you though tonight. Because the truth of the night is we're not the hero of every story. We're not the Jesus of this text. We are the them of this text. Let the church shout them. I know it's easy to surmise that the them of this text, this personal pronoun that speaks to a crowd of known people. I know we want to say the them is the Judases of the group and the them are, are, are the Sanhedrins and the them, talk with me somebody, are the Roman soldiers who will nail their hands and the Jewish religious leaders and Caiaphas and Pilate. But I want to suggest tonight that's a too, that's a too close view. Zoom out if you will. And here is what I want to announce tonight. I'm a part of the them. 
and I'm glad tonight that when I was in the them crowd he prayed father forgive them I didn't got myself happy I got four more minutes I'm going to sit down friends the other day I was getting ready to fuss at Dylan Dylan in church tonight I was fussing at Dylan because we just bought Dylan a cell phone and Dylan had the case off of his phone and I said Dylan you're gonna drop that phone and you're gonna crack the back Dylan looked at me and said daddy I don't know why you're fussing at me he said daddy your back is already cracked the only reason we can't see it is because it's been covered I wish I had somebody in this church tonight that could testify I've got some cracks in my back. I've got cracked character, a cracked attitude. I, I wish I had a witness in here. I've been cracked by my life. I've been cracked by temptation. But will you just shake one neighbor's hand and tell them, neighbor, thank God I'm covered. Can't you see it? Three crosses on a hill. One was a cross of rebellion. One was a cross of repentance. But the one in the middle was a cross of redemption. Three crosses on a hill. One possessed a sinner one possessed a saint but the one in the middle was the cross of a savior three crosses on a hill one would suffer condemnation one would be granted justification but that cross in the middle would provide salvation three crosses on a hill one was a cross of punishment. One was a cross of penitence. But that cross in the middle was a cross of propitiation. Three crosses on a hill. One died in his sins. One died to his sins. Oh, but that cross in the middle. He died for all sin. And Jesus spoke to a convicted criminal on one of those crosses and declared today thou shalt be with me in paradise now, now wait a minute preacher I, I, I thought I thought this man was guilty I know that Jesus was being railroaded but I thought that both criminals hanging beside him were guilty as charged how is it that this low down dirty criminal could get saved well, if you got eight more minutes, I can show you. Number one, write this down. Number one, proximity is not always an indicator. <laughs> both, both crosses on the side are the same distance from the cross in the middle. Both thieves are the same vicinity from Jesus. Yet one gets in and the other gets left out. Which leads me to believe that you can be in close proximity to Jesus and still be lost. Judas walked with him for three days, three years, day, day by day with him. And he was still a devil because proximity is not always an indicator. With your ushering self. With your Sunday school teaching self. With with your deaconing, trusteeing, and preaching self, with your I've been a member of this church 40 years self, 
with your first giving honor to God who is ahead of my life self. With, whenever you get finished with your holy self, just because you're close to Jesus in proximity doesn't mean that you know him. Or more importantly, it doesn't mean that he knows you because proximity is not always an indicator. Here's number two, write that down, write this down. Um, petitions are accepted from an agitator. Can I, can I show it to you? Luke, Luke, Luke leaves this subtle detail out, but, but Matthew 27, 44 says that the thieves, say thieves, were crucified, who were crucified with him cast insults at him. Mark 15, verse 32 says, they, say they, that were crucified with him reviled him. Both Matthew and Mark clearly state that both of the criminals started out mocking Jesus. While they were enduring the, the same suffering as our Savior, they were agitating him. And before you judge these brothers too quickly, let me tell you that we are no better than them. Okay, maybe you've been Jesus Jr. Maybe you've never made a mistake, but that's not my story. I'm no better than these thieves. But here's the good news. While one continued taunting him, the other decided to turn. <laughs> Lord, help me preach. Is there anybody in the building who ever made a decision to turn? I mean, you used to be a drug addict, but you turn. You used to be a liar and a backstabber, but you turn. You, you used to be a manipulator, but you turn. You used to be slanging and banging but you turn you used to open your legs and lay down with every Tom Dick and Harry but thanks be to God that you anybody glad that you didn't die before you turned watch this 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 brother made a shift his body is going through the horrible trauma and agony of crucifixion in a moment when most would assume that his awareness was foggy as he was experiencing excruciating pain yet his cognitive clarity becomes crystal clear with insight that he's never had before and he makes a bold petition Lord remember me justice demanded that I die justice demanded that I go to hell I had a one way ticket that I rightfully earned that's my testimony but one day I came to my senses and I cried out to Jesus and I'm so glad that he still accepts the petitions of an agitator proximity is not always an indicator petitions are accepted from an agitator and finally number three write this down Pardons are the business of the creator. <laughs> Does that make anybody other than me happy? I, I'm from the old church. Y'all remember the old church? Y'all remember when, when pastors used to vote members in? Yeah, y'all understand. I mean, I mean, sure, it was probably a mere formality. I've never, uh, I've never witnessed anybody um, vote nay when the pastor was voting the member in. But it gave the appearance that church folk actually had a voice in matters that were only God's business. But aren't you glad that folk don't have a heaven or hell to put you in? Jesus didn't run this by a committee. He didn't ask for a motion or a second. He didn't put the man on trial for a period of time to see if he deserved salvation. He simply said today. Lord, not tomorrow, but, but today. Not, not after you get yourself together, but today. Not, not one of these days, but today. Today thou shalt be with me. That, that makes me happy. And I don't know where you want to be, but I want to be wherever Jesus is. He says, thou shall be with me. But, but the man was guilty, Jamil. That's none of your business. But, but the man had never served in church, Jamil. That's none of your business. But the man has not been baptized, Jamil. That's none of your business. But the man has not spoken in tongues, Jamil. That ain't none of your business. The man went to heaven with his coattail smoking because pardons are the business of the creator. 
And Jesus said today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Somebody say paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Somebody say paradise. Where the wicked shall cease from troubling and the weary shall be at rest. Say paradise. Where every day is Sunday and the Sabbath shall have no end. Say paradise. Where every day is howdy howdy and never goodbye. Say paradise. Free gates on the east. Free gates on the west. Free gates on the north. Free gates on the south. Say paradise. Here is Jesus marching toward the benediction of his earthly existence. He's hanging there at the intersection of the vertical and the horizontal. He's doing the work of salvation, but he spots Mary and John amidst the onlooking crowd and realizes that he now needs to do the work of a son. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Now I can see that this is a dying son's request to take care of his mother. I can see that this word is a reminder that children all to honor their parents and that we have a duty to our families. But surely, these are more than the final words of a family man. Surely there has to be a deeper context because Jesus always spoke and moved in light of a greater kingdom agenda. Now, in full transparency and uh, 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 vulnerability tonight, I don't really know for sure. So let me simply suggest or imply what the broader message may have been, at least to me. How, how this word and motion spoke to me. Might I suggest that this action of Jesus, uh, he was displaying a willingness to take care of us. Jesus is firmly now in the grip of death. He looks out and amidst great anguish, beaten and bleeding, and turns his attention to his mother, ensuring that she would be cared for uh, uh, after his physical absence. In his taking care of his mother, it says to me that he's also ready, willing, and able to take care of me also. Why? Why? Because I'm part of the family. That there is an incident recorded in Luke chapter 8 verses 19 through 21 where Jesus was teaching and outside his mother and brothers showed up. Because of the great crowd, they were not able to get to Jesus. And they told Jesus, listen, your mother and your brothers on the outside wanting to see you. And Jesus says, well, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. This was not a demotion of his biological family, but it was a promotion of his spiritual family. That, that, that here is the reality, obeying and doing the word of God puts me in relationship with Jesus. And could it be, brothers and sisters, 
that this act of compassion with his mother and John has a broader kingdom message that if Jesus is willing to look out for family at Calvary, he's willing to provide for all of his family who hears and does the word of God. But, but not only is he ready and willing to, to take care of us, it also says to me that he has enough power to take care of us. Yeah, yeah, th this act of Jesus caring for his mother encourages me because if Jesus can provide for the needs of his mother in the moment of his deepest weakness and humiliation, it tells me that his power is greater than the most dire situation and circumstance we can face. When Jesus speaks to Mary, he was enduring unimaginable physical agony, unimaginable physical anguish, yet in his weakness and vulnerability, he has the power to care for her needs. Mary, I, I, I know I'm bleeding, Mary. I, I know I'm broken, Mary. I know that I am bloody and beaten, but guess what? I still have enough power to speak to your need. And all brothers and sisters, as believers, we ought to be able to take comfort and joy in knowing that regardless of our circumstances, no matter how dark the night, how rough the seas, we can come to Jesus. Jesus with boldness trusting that he comfort that we confidently know he has the power to make a way somehow have you any rivers that seem uncrossable have you any mountains that you cannot tunnel through have you any diseases that seem incurable have you any problems that seem in unfixable well I'm trying to tell you tonight we serve a God that has so much power that he specializes in things that are thought impossible. Oh, bless his name. There's one more thing that I believe this text teaches us in the context of a larger kingdom agenda. I believe it teaches us that we have a new family. Yeah, yeah, notice that Jesus did not follow the custom and expectations of the day by giving his mother to his own brothers. Mary, look to John. John, look to Mary as your mother. I told you earlier, I don't know, but could it be that in the context of the kingdom at the cross, Jesus was establishing a new family unit one in which the family is redefined as the family of God known as the church. Not confined simply to DNA. No wonder the Bible says that Christ purchased the church of God with his own blood. One of the gifts our Savior gave us at the foot of the cross was the church. That th th this relationship that Jesus establishes at the cross shows us that we have a family beyond our family. That's why I thank God for the church, a community of faith caring for one another. That's why I thank God for the church, a community of faith supporting, encouraging each other, sharing in our joys and sorrows and challenges of life. I thank God that I have a savior who's willing to care for me. I thank God that I have a savior that has the power to care for me. And I thank God for the church, my family of faith. No wonder the hymn writer said, bless be the ties that bind our hearts together in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and 
our cares in the family of God. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. But when we are called to part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Because one glad morning, when this life is over, from sorrow, toil, pain, and sin, we shall all be free and have perfect love and friendship that shall reign throughout all eternity. The Spanish priest and 16th century reformer, St. John of the Cross, penned dark night of the soul. He delves into the profound depths of the soul's midnight experiences. He describes that these moments are periods when the soul's affections weigh heavily and constrain it, leaving it unable to stir or find comfort in anything temporal. He says that the darkness of the soul are moments when there is no reflection of meaningful experiences. And a thick, heavy cloud comes upon the soul, keeping it in affliction as if it were far from God. And while you may be unfamiliar tonight with the dark night of the soul, there are others who comprehend its distressing reality. That regardless of one's status or circumstances, as we consider the statement of Jesus tonight to be the most unsettling among the seven. Darkness blanketed Calvary at midday. As Jesus endured his dark night of the soul, crying out to the Father from the silence, the most anguished cry in human history. This is what I'm trying to say tonight, and I'll say a few things. Dark nights are common when the activities and the achievements and the known direction of our lives collapse. Jesus cries, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Quickly tonight, he angles his cry toward his abandonment as he deals with the agony of being brutalized for serving. Listen to me tonight. This cry reminds us that regardless of what we do, we still have to bear a cross because serving God is not a pass on pain nor is it an exemption of hurt. Listen tonight. He doesn't cry with the strength of his word words but in the most painful time of his life he repeats the scripture Jesus reaches back to the opening verse of David's lament in Psalms 22 and 1 notice tonight the living word quotes the written word the incarnate word quotes the inspired word with all of the scriptures that he could have grabbed for this present situation or even with his fluency he could have created a new statement but while hanging from the cross he quotes a psalm of lament because what else can you do while hanging from a cross than to cry what tonight do you regret 
regurgitate in your time of lamenting. I think this is interesting because Jesus shows us that if you get enough word in you in the absence of suffering, it'll be your response when calamity strikes in your life. He angles his cry towards his abandonment, but then he also asserts his feelings. Why? God, what's going on? Dean John Kenny says that there's times that darkness covers the face of the earth and your soul. There's no agony like being deserted or left alone by the one you love the most. Listen to me tonight, suffering will cause you to be unsettled by your feelings. But I want to tell you tonight that he shows us in this cry that there's nothing wrong with asserting your feelings. There is nothing wrong with getting in the face of God and being honest about where you are. I know you keep telling people you're doing fine, but the truth is you're falling apart. I know you keep telling people you're holding holding your head up but the truth is you don't know when you're going to do something that you'll regret later there is nothing wrong with getting in the face of God and being honest about where you are because this is what he shows us there's nothing wrong with questioning God through your moments of prayer because questioning God in prayer is an act of faith the closer you get to God the more he's able to handle your complaints because he's not intimidated by what you have the audacity to ask him for. It, it is said that when Martin Luther read this he sat for hours, said nothing, wrote nothing but he finally pushed back from the table after reading this and he finally responded God forsaken by God <laughs> how, how, how can this be? How could he be abandoned when he had been assigned? He, he angles his cry toward his abandonment. I'm done. He angles his cry toward his abandonment. He asserts his feelings. He's honest about how he feels. And he's honest about where he is. Then while he angles his cry toward his abandonment, he asserts his feelings. But wait a minute. He reaffirms his trust in spite of being forsaken. My God. It, it, it is noteworthy that this is the only time that Jesus addresses God this way in prayer. In all the other recorded prayers, he uses the term Father which reflects their intimacy but in this hour of greatest desolation he addresses God in the manner of all the other petitioners it doesn't represent a loss of faith but the fact that he prays and says my God shows that his trust is still in God but the intimacy of the fellowship seems to be broken just for our benefit there is a loss of contact and he no longer feels close to the presence of his father. He was forgotten by the father so we could be remembered. I'm closing with tension tonight. Was he forsaken? It's argued that he was because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Others argue that there's the separation and the reason he feels forsaken is because that's what sin causes you to feel like. He, he had taken on sin for us, but God was still near. But either way tonight, if he was forsaken or felt forsaken, thank God he held on to his assignment. He opens up with Psalms 22, but he does not give us the rest of the Psalms 
psalm because the rest of the psalm helps us to understand that it doesn't end in dereliction. The rest of the psalm doesn't end in abandonment, but the rest of the psalm ends in hope. That's all I'm trying to tell you tonight, that though you feel forsaken, I want to tell you tonight, God is right where he's always been. My God, I want to tell you that my God is a cry of hope. I'm signing off. My son is six years old now, and he likes basketball, but he also likes riding his bicycle from time to time. And one day he's riding his bike, and he says, Daddy, I'm going to go out far, but I don't want you to leave me. I want you to keep on watching me. I allowed him to go up the street, and I allowed him to turn around the corner to where he could not see me. And by the time I turned the corner, there my son was paused and says, Daddy, I thought you left me. I said, no, son, you can't see me, but I can see you. That's what I want to tell you tonight. Be able to say, my God, touch somebody. I'm done. My time is up, but just touch somebody and tell them, neighbor, it won't end like this. But tell them there's hope for you tomorrow. Touch somebody and tell them it won't always be like this. The Lord will perfect that concerning you. Touch them out and tell them sooner or later it's gonna work in your favor. Yes, yes, ah, it's gonna work. Grab somebody and tell them, neighbor, it's gonna work. Weeping me endure for a night, but ah, joy. Clap your hands and give God for these preachers. Thank God for these preachers. Would you look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor God is where he's always been. Come on, clap your hand and give God big praise tonight. What wonderful preachers we've had the privilege of enjoying some of the nation's best are here in one place tonight. Would you thank God for those we've heard already? Real quickly, it's giving time, and we want you to prepare your hearts and minds to honor the Lord with your gifts. I'm going to ask that you would prepare your hearts and minds to sow a seed tonight. This is Good Friday night. This is the night that the Lord has died for us. And so I want to, if you will, if you will follow me in giving tonight, I'll ask that each of you tonight would sow uh, at least a $20 seed. If you heard me say amen. Let's try it again. If you'll sow at least a $20 seed, say amen real loud. Amen. Let's do that. Uh, we thank God for the pastor of this church, Pastor Dwight Townsend. Come on, give God praise for him. We thank God for the Lonely Church for hosting this. Come on, give God praise for them. Now let's make sure that we have done our part, this portion of the worship experience, by participating in this service by sowing seed. If you do not have the $20, would you get as close as possible? But I would that you at least give $20 seed tonight. Uh, that'll help this church and those responsible not be burdened. Uh, for blessing us in such a major way. Amen. Amen. Lift your gift to the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you now for gift and givers. We thank you now for seeds being sown. I thank you now, God, for the word that's gone forth. Now we sow seed and we thank you for the blessing that comes from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I don't know how we, we walk. I wanted to be an usher. Let me do this. I want because I wanted to be an usher when I was young. And I got off the usher board because they never would give me this spot. 
They had me on a corner somewhere. I always want to say, would everybody please stand? <laughs> face the right and obey the uh, direction of the usher in the rear. Everybody face the right. It reaches to the highest mountain. It Let's go to the chorus. It reaches to the highest mountain. and say the blood, the blood that gives me strength from day. Come on, lift it today. It will never. Never lose. Lift your voice and say it reaches. To the highest, to the highest mountain, oh yes it does, and it flows to the Lord's valley, come on lift your voice and say valley, oh yeah, the blood that gives me strength. From day to day, never lose. Come on, let's lift it up again. I said it reach ya. I can't hear y'all. To the highest mountain. Oh, yes, it does. And it flows to the lowest valley. To the lowest valley. Oh, yes. The blood that gives me strength. Come on, church. Today. It will never, never lose. Now, if you're thankful for the blood, let's lift it high. I know it reaches to the highest. Oh, thank you, Lord. To the highest mountain. I wasn't up there. Came and found me way down in a valley. Oh, yes. The blood that gives me strength from day. Thank you, Jesus. It will not. <laughs> Never lose. If you know his Savior, let's sing it one more time. Oh! It'll reach to the highest. Reach to the highest mountain. But that's not where I was. He came and found me. I was way down in a valley. Say, oh yes, oh yes, the blood hey, that gives me strength <laughs> from day to day. It will never say it again, it will never. God tonight, it will never. I'm waiting on you. I thank God tonight, it will never. Anybody thank 
And if I didn't thank him, it will never lose. Now touch two or three people and say never. You didn't say it right. Tell them never. One more person, tell them never. Now look at somebody, tell them never have. Never will. I wish y'all came ready. Turn around, tell somebody, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you're dealing with. Never have. And he never will. Never. These words represent the only words of our Lord spoken indicating discomfort and pain. I thirst. It is natural to thirst when the body is suffering from fatigue, from agony, from grief. The heat of the day and of course, for our Lord, the loss of blood. But even though our Lord is suffering, he is disproving the accusations and fully proving that he is the Messiah. He is fulfilling some. 69 and 21 where it says he received the vinegar as it is stated in the scripture in death Jesus is dispelling myths and still dispersing truths look at what he's doing he's first of all looking out for us before he looks out for himself. Jesus did not think of himself until after his atoning work had been completed. He's not complaining about pain. He's complying with prophecy. God had already said that all of these things were going to happen. But isn't that just like our Savior? He's always looking out for us. He was always hungering for us. He was always thirsting for us. Thirsting that this human society, brothers and sisters, would accept the redemptive salvation that he was offering to us. He was always looking out for us before he looked out for himself. In his soul, he wanted us to be righteous. In his soul, he wanted us to be worthy. In his soul, brothers and sisters, he is so travailed that he would one day, or we would one day receive the salvation that he was offering to us. So before he says, I thirst, he is looking out for us and he has made sure that all scripture has been fulfilled he's looking out for us before he looks out for himself but not only is he looking out for us before he looks out for himself he's unashamed to express his pain on that cross Jesus utters his only words of discomfort and pain to a community of people who had wronged him he could have said, I'm not allowing these people to think they hurt me. I'm not allowing these people to think they've beaten me. I'm not allowing these people to think 
that they have actually won this battle. But brothers and sisters, he is not ashamed to voice his weakness because he is still winning. Oh, the joy of your enemies when they think they've beaten you. They count you out fast, don't they? They keep their foot on you. They think they have their foot on you when they, when they really think they have you beaten. All oh, the joy that they have when they think they have won. But what our enemies don't know is that we are trusting in a power that's much greater than us. And can somebody in here testify tonight that even when you think you got me, you ain't really got me. When you think you won, you're not really winning, brothers and sisters. I may look like I'm weak now, but I serve a God who knows how to strengthen me in times of need. He's looking out for us when we can before he looks out for himself. He's unashamed, brothers and sisters, to express his pain, but I'm getting in my seat and leaving the time to the rest of these brothers when I say, brothers and sisters, that he's drawing men to him even in death. Now, he had refused the hyssop at first because he would not be numbed to the full effects of the cross. If he was going to meet death, he would meet it without the intake of the properties that would not allow him to feel it all. He wanted to feel it all so that he could fulfill prophecy, brothers and sisters. He would not be numbed to it. Can I drop a word on us on this, on this evening? There are too many of us who are trying to numb ourselves from the pain that we really need to be feeling. God needs you to feel all of that process. He needs you to go through all of that stuff. He needs you to feel everything about it, brothers and sisters. Why? So he can show you how much power he has to bring you out of it. Can anybody here say, I'm not going to numb myself with drugs. I'm not going to numb myself with alcohol. I'm not going to numb myself with trying to be sleep all day long. I'm going to trust in the power of God to bring me through. He would not be numbed by the intake of properties that would keep him, brothers and sisters, from feeling the full effects of the cross. But brothers and sisters, yeah, now that all scripture has been fulfilled, he can now allow his body to cry out for the relief that it needs. And when he cries out, I thirst, it touches the heart of a nameless soldier. Who comes running to, to, to give him sour beverage, brothers and sisters, that would soothe him in this hour. Brothers and sisters, and he placed it, the Bible says, in his mouth. I want to say to you, staying faithful to God's will for your life will eventually cause your enemies to drop their grudge. Let me say it one more time. Staying true to God's will for your life, brothers and sisters, and staying faithful to God's will will eventually cause your enemies to drop their grudge. I'm concluding this when I say, but while the Roman soldier had dropped his grudge, the Roman government had already made a mistake of lifting him up. Because I heard him say, and I, if I, be lifted up. It is finished. Jesus, blood is everywhere. And Jesus is teaching us how to die. When you get out of here, your work ought to be done. 
this penultimate word that he belts from the cross is a word that he says, it's three words in our English vernacular, it is finished. We got a subject, it. Linking verb to be is. Action verb finished. That's the English. But Jesus says but one word on the cross. In the Greek word he belts out is tetelestai. Let the church say tetelestai. You got your Greek lesson for tonight. Tetelestai is one word and it is a third person singular perfect passive indicative verb. It has width and it has depth. It's just one word, but it has a deeper meaning. It's third person, which suggests he's not saying, I am finished. It's third person which suggests to us he's not saying you are finished but because it's third person it's it it's an inanimate object object that has no animation what describes to us a third person singular reality in English is the word it it is finished it's a third person singular perfect passive indicative verb. It's third person and it's singular. Everybody shout singular. singular. Now when you understand what you come here to do, you ought to do it. When, when, when you figure out the thing the Lord called you to do, it's you ought to do it. You ain't got to have a whole list of stuff. It's just usually just one singular thing that the Lord is trying to get through you. And Jesus outlines it for us right here by saying it is finished. He is saying one singular thing is complete. I didn't come to do extra. I came to do the essential. It's a third person singular. Perfect passive indicative verb. It's third person singular and it's perfect. Let the church shout perfect. perfect. It's in the perfect tense. And perfect tense describes not that it has no flaws, but that it has no failure. The, 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 the perfect tense describes essentially what is happening to the word and happening to the moment. If you look at, if you want to get a diagram of perfect, perfect is when you take your pencil, put a dot on the page, pull your pencil off, and then put another dot and draw a line and never stop. The perfect tense describes an action that was completed in the past, but yet still felt in the future. It has no faults. And it has no failures. It's perfect. That means that the work that he's done, that the work that he did was felt then and completed then and is still felt now. And I wonder if we got a witness in here that feels what you feel because you still feel what Jesus did on that cross. Shout, it's perfect. It's a third person singular. Perfect passive indicative verb. Let the church say passive. Now, passive, 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 passive is a little bit different. It describes, in, in, in English, when you get passive, you have passive, uh, you have middle, and then you have active. Well, well, well for, for this particular verb, for this particular moment, it is passive. So, uh, let me give it to you this way. An active verb would say, Matthew hit the ball. A passive verb describes that Matthew was hit by the ball. So him saying it is finished on the cross describes not an action that hit you and I, but it's an action that struck him. Isaiah put it like this, he was wounded for our transgression. 
he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, okay, all right, I got time. It's, 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 it's passive, which means the action that happened was an action that happened to him. He took the cross that had our name on it. He bore the sins that we committed. He, he took the pain that we had and he got the hit. It's, 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 third, it's a third person singular pers- perfect passive indicative verb. Somebody shout indicative. This, this is the mood. This is the mood of the word. This, this word indicative one word describes it in English, fact. Whenever there is a word that is indicative, it denotes that it is a fact. The truth that Jesus speaks from the cross is that this that I have finished is a fact to be finished. Docetism and docetists would have you to believe that Jesus was a spirit without a body. Ebonists would have you to believe uh, that he was a body without divinity. So in essence, docetists believe he didn't have no dirt. Ebonists believe he didn't have no divinity. But because of what Jesus said, it is true, he did do it. And the truth of the matter is, is that you've got to trust in the fact that Jesus said it is finished because when he says it, it is done, it's indicative. And I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing, but I want you to speak an indicative over it, that the Lord will fight my battles, that the Lord will see me through, that I am the head and not the tail. I will make it through and make it indicative. I'm done. It's a third person singular, perfect, passive. Indicative verb. They messed up. I didn't tell you what it meant. The word to telestai means it is finished, but the, the actual meaning means paid in full. Oh, 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 don't shout, shout. Don't shout yet. Don't shout. Oh, 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 don't shout. Don't shout yet. I got a minute left. Don't shout yet. Don't shout. Don't shout, don't shout yet. Hold it, hold it, hold your shout for a second. What it suggests is, it, I got to cut across the field. Here, here is what Jesus was saying. In those particular times, what would happen is when someone was in a Roman prison, outside of their jail cell, all of their crimes would be tacked to their cell. And every prisoner that had committed a crime, all of their crimes always followed them. The only way that they would be free of their crimes is that the judge would have to write to Telestai on their walking papers. Nobody that ever died ever received a tetelestai. So what Jesus was saying to us that I might die today, but I'm going to still get my walking papers when it's all said and done. Is there anybody glad that they killed him on Friday? But early Sunday morning, he got his walking papers. So I'm so glad that he got his walking papers. They messed up though. They messed, they, they, they messed up. They was all right when they nailed him in his left hand. They were just fine when they nailed him in his right hand. They were okay when they nailed him in his feet. Just super okay when they put a crown of thorns on his head. But the problem they had if they would have just buried him right then, we wouldn't be in here shouting his name. But since they lifted him up, I'm going to go ahead and finish it for you. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And I'm so glad they lifted him. I'm so glad they raised him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me, he died, lifted him.
was March 6th in 2023 when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. The internet was awash with varying conspiracy theories as to the cause of this multi-billion dollar bank completely falling apart. Known for holding the assets of tech companies, Silicon Valley Bank was a subject of scrutiny and speculation. Why did the bank, worth multiple billions of dollars, fail? The reality was much less startling than the conspiracies. The reality was that they put their assets in declining bonds. And when the rates rose, the bonds sank and lost their value. They made bad investments. They put good assets into the wrong hands. The right thing in the wrong hands quickly becomes a lost thing. The right thing in the wrong hands is a recipe for catastrophe. I wonder, do you know what's happening here on this cross? Because the truth is, this doesn't seem like a good Friday. We are in the midst of a distressing emergency that could potentially result in a return to the cosmological chaos that was the state of the universe in Genesis 1-2. Where the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. The order, beauty, and purpose of creation are built by and upon the second person of the Godhead who is Jesus Christ. It's Colossians 1, 16 and 17 that says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. John 1 and 3, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made the natural world is dependent upon his spiritual essence. Matthew's gospel relates that as Jesus is dying there for six total hours in the second half of his death sentence, there are three hours of unscheduled, unexplainable darkness. There's also an earthquake that shook the earth and split the mountains. It's because creation's very survival was dependent on the safekeeping of the preeminent entity in the natural world. Listen, Christ's spirit is the bridge between the unseen reality of divine intention and the observable reality of cosmological existence. His spirit is the conduit through which God's eternal cosmic plan flows into space, matter, and time. If Jesus goes down and his spirit is not cared for, it all falls apart. And so Jesus, in an excruciating effort of royal responsibility, painfully raises himself up again to open his collapsing lungs and breathing passageways to utter one final word from the cross that 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 penultimate word in john 19 29 confirmed that redemption had been irrevocably secured through his fulfillment of the law and prophecy and his satisfaction of divine wrath but this last word is a means of transferring his indispensable essential essence from his human expression into the safekeeping of his eternal expression he does this church to ensure the survival 
revival of all creation. He does it so that creation will not fall apart, but he says it out loud for people to hear because he's not just saving creation, he's teaching a lesson. He is performing pedagogy through public petition. He and the Father let us eavesdrop in on a private conversation so that we can learn something significant from this last cry from the cross. It's simply this, that if Jesus can trust God with the most important and critical essence in the universe, then you and I can trust God with every matter, small and great, critical and essential in our lives and for our sojourn on this terrestrial plane. All I'm saying is that when it comes to the matters of your soul and your situation, you and I are responsible for making the right investment with the matters that matter to us. Jesus teaches us to give our issues, concerns, problems, highs, lows, joys, and sorrows into the hands of the only one who can be trusted to properly manage the matters of our lives. He says that you should put everything in the Father's hands. And I don't have time to give you all four of these movements in the lesson tonight, but I do want to highlight them, drop them off, and then we're going on. Y'all got singing and shouting to do later on. But listen, here it is. It, it is Jesus teaching us in this matter of direct deposit that God can be trusted with my afflictions. There he is, nails in his hands, a spike in his feet, his back ripped to ribbons by that cat of nine tails, the leather whip that had sheep bone and metal in it. There he is, crowned with some 72 thorns, and Jesus is in agony and pain. But the text reveals to us that the pain is not accidental or incidental. The pain has purpose. And might I remind us that in our worst crises and hottest crucibles, Jesus is reminding us that your afflictions also have purpose. You do recall he told you that if you're going to come after me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. It is that great, uh, that great theologian who declared, friends, that when Christ calls a person, Bonhoeffer says, he bids him to come and die. There's no way to follow a suffering savior without experiencing suffering seasons. And while I am in the midst of pain and agony, predicaments that I'd rather not have to deal with, what I can trust God with is that whatever the outcome of my affliction, God has ordained the affliction to produce a positive outcome. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and those who are the call. I gotta go. Listen, he can be trusted with my afflictions, but he can be also trusted with my limitations. Here it is. Jesus is under a self-imposed emptying of divine attributes. It is what we know of theologically as kenosis. Philippians 2 says he humbled himself. He emptied himself of certain divine attributes for the sake of fully participating in the human experience because it was necessary for him to be fully human in order to be qualified to be the savior of humankind. And so he empties himself of omnipresence, limiting himself to being in one place at one time. He empties himself even of omnipresence he says some things the father has kept for his own knowledge he empties himself friends of being able to do just about all of the divine things other than there are times when there are circumstances and situations that create these leaks in his life where divinity flows out for the sake of human um, understanding so he lets divinity leak out when he takes two fish five loaves and feeds the multitude. He lets divinity leak out when he spits on the ground, makes miracle whip, puts it on a man's eyes, tells him to go wash and come back seeing. He lets divinity leak out when he goes by Lazarus's tomb and says, Lazarus, get up. I need you to live for a few more days. He lets it leak out, but here on the cross, he is fully in the embrace of his human limitations. Listen, church, he knows that he will expire. He will give up the ghost. He will die 
die. So in his limitedness, he leans into the father's limitlessness. And I came to talk to Superman and Wonder Woman and to remind you to embrace your limitations. You can't be there for everybody. You can't be at everything. You are not responsible to save people from every situation. Embrace your limitations. You are a limited commodity. You are a rare and precious jewel that should not always be everywhere with everybody's everything. Sometimes you got to give them the holy no because you're limited. In fact, you can't just not solve everybody's problems. You can't even solve all your own problems. But it is when I embrace my limitations that I open the pathway for God's limitlessness. It's when God will not take the thorn that I realize his grace is sufficient for me. I got, um, I, I, he can be trusted with my afflictions. I got to go. My limitations. He can be trusted, wait a minute, with my transitions. From, from, from death to life. Uh, from life to death. From purpose to prize. From vulnerability on Friday to the invincibility that is coming in the resurrection. Life is full of transitions. And when I'm in a transitional space, that, that liminal space where I'm not alive but I ain't dead yet either. When, when it ain't over but, but it ain't starting either when, when I'm not happy but I'm not depressed either in those liminal spaces of transition I can trust that the hand of God can handle my seasons of transition okay I'm from DC area uh, I, I, I grew up in the DC area and we used to uh, we used to ride the buses or the trains uh, to, to go places and um, and between uh, buses and trains um, they, they gave us uh, a little slip of paper you could pay to to ride anywhere uh, all day uh, but they gave you what's called a transfer the transfer said I've already paid the fare so so what I'm gonna do is when I get on this next bus or board this next train you can't charge me twice because the fare has been paid and the evidence that I paid the price to keep on riding is that I got my transfer in my hand and that's what Jesus does on the cross he's about to make a transfer from his full humanity to the embrace again of his full divinity and the cross is the ticket that testifies that he has paid the price so that he can be our all sufficient savior he has paid the price to be able to enjoy again the songs of the Holy of heaven he has paid the price whereby God has given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow I gotta go I gotta go I gotta go they gotta go saying they gotta go saying um, last thing he can be trusted uh, with my reputation because when Jesus utters this word he gives up the ghost the Bible says uh, that a Roman centurion looks at him and says surely this must be the son of God. Isn't it interesting that the man comes to that conclusion in Jesus' death when he could not see it in his life? You got to know that Jesus um, is hanging as a criminal uh, on these trumped up charges being treated like a common caught slave. They had been dogging his name all in the trials. They dogged his name, not just when he got to the trials in the high priest house and then in Roman government halls. No, they had been dogging his name since Mama Mary claimed that she was pregnant and didn't know a man. They, 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 they've been dogging his name a long time. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? They've been dogging his name a long time. They accused him of being Beelzebub, the prince of demons. They accused him of being a wine bibber or a drunk. They, they've been dogging his name a long time. They accused him of being a blasphemer and then convicted him of being an insurrectionist and a traitor. But then finally in his death, the way he handled the worst moment of his life shone forth the best truths of his nature. And I'm talking to somebody here and I'm suggesting when you 
you put things in God's hands, you don't have to defend yourself and you don't have to argue with people about your reputation. When you put yourself in God's hands, God will handle your reputation if you just handle your assignment. I got to go church, but would you look at somebody and say, neighbor, I ain't got time to argue with you. I'm on assignment. I, I don't have time to prove to you that I love the Lord or that God's hand is on my life or that God has the wind at my back. Just keep on watching me and don't just see me in my highs. See my faithfulness in my lows. When I'm being crushed and crucified, if I hold on to God in the midst of it, God will change their minds if you don't change your character. I gotta go. I gotta go. Uh, but wait, 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 wait. Like, like word number four, Frank, like word number four and in the intimation of word number five Jesus is once again referring to the Psalms on the cross there Psalm 4 is Psalm 22 and then Psalm 5 uh, the thirst is Psalm 69 and, and then church uh, Jesus again quotes Psalm 31 5 to say this last word isn't it interesting he's at the height of his suffering he's been dying for six hours he's been dogged and criticized he's been betrayed by Judas and abandoned by all the disciples except John he's watching his mother weep in agony and yet he finds a way to handle his suffering I'm through by singing a song now I don't know how you feel about this but it seems to me that these realities are antithetical how in the world are you singing while suffering but here's what he's teaching us he's teaching us the only way to really handle suffering is to start singing. I got to go, but somebody's got some trouble and some trial. Somebody's in some tribulation. Can, can we turn this last word into testimony service? Would you look at somebody right quick and say, neighbor, first giving honor to God, who's the head of my life. To tell a neighbor to the pastor, the deacons, the saints, and the friends. Tell, tell him, neighbor, I just want to sing a song right quick. Tell him, all in his hands. I put it all in his hands. All in his hands. I put it all in his hands. All of my burdens, my problems, unanswered questions. I, I, I put it all thought I would have had a witness here. Yes, I put it all. I, I put it all in his hands. Don't stop singing that song. Look at that same neighbor and say, neighbor, whatever the problem, I put it all in his hands. I know that he can solve them. I put it all in his hands. Don't stop singing just yet. Just one more verse tonight. This woo, and that. I put it all in his hands. He can handle it. That's a fact. I put it all in his hands. We can't leave the bridge out. No matter how great and no matter how small, he is the master of them all. And I Ah, ah, yeah. I put it all in his hand. Good night now, y'all. But would you turn to one more person? Find you somebody and say, neighbor, I keep on praying that prayer. My family in his hands. My business in his hands. My children in his hands. My enemies in his hands. The sickness in my body in his hand. The confusion in my mind in his hands. My long lonely nights in his hands. This woo, and that. This, this. And that this 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 and that why would
Would you put it in his hands? Can we sing one more song tonight? In the midst of our suffering, find you one more person and say, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're fighting with. I don't know what's making you cry. But tell them, neighbor, I got one more song. Tell them, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Believe his wings of love abide. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. He will. Yes, he will. St. Mark, y'all getting this every Sunday. <laughs> New Hope, y'all getting that every Sunday. <laughs> A Street, y'all getting that every Sunday. Pine Bluff, y'all getting that every Sunday. Thank God for my brothers for coming to share with us on tonight. Let me just say a few things. We're closing. We're closing in great time. We've done what the Lord has told us to do. We're finishing it, um, doing this one singular thing that the Lord has called us to do uh, on tonight. Amen. We thank uh, Miss Shari Walker, who I think she had to leave, but she came and she blessed us with the old rugged cross. Uh, amen. Bless you. Thank her. Share it with us on tonight. Uh, to my pastor, Pastor Eric Alexander, say amen for him. Call him sir. Amen. My brother from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Amen. Who faithfully, faithfully reminds all of them that he was the first executive pastor. Amen. Amen. Pastor Deshaun Jared. My brother, Pastor Jamil West from the East Street Church. Thank you, brother. Amen. My brother Derek Easter. Amen. From New St. Hurricane, Pine Bluff. And, uh, all the way from Detroit. <laughs> Pastor Frank Harris Jr., y'all. Yeah. By way of Memphis, by way of Pine Bluff, amen. And uh, he got in the car today, say, T, one more time. One more time is at home, one more time. And then the new pastor. Bless you, man. Yeah. Yeah. We say to you, welcome to Little Rock, North Little Rock, Arkansas. God bless you, Pastor Shears, Lady Shears. God bless you. Thank you. And then that. Lord, what are we going to do with Philip Pointer? Amen. Woo! Yeah! 
Thank all of the churches that supported. I see every church represented here tonight. Every church. Thank you all. Every church. Thank you all. Thank you all for representing. Amen. Thank you all for representing. The bishops came by to see us. Bishop is our big bro. He, he has to come and make sure we're doing it right. Amen. So he nodded me and said, you done good. You done good. All right. We, we know it's all right when Bishop says it's all right. Thank you, other pastors, Pastor McDade, Pastor Scotty, and other pastors who are here. If you're a pastor, will you stand? Staff pastors, oh, y'all stand too. I see other ministers. Pastor Yao, my friend, Sam, Pastor Yao, Pastor Thomas, yeah, Pastor Ritson, Pastor Glenn, hey, Pastor Chris, and Pastor Mona. We grew up together, you know that, amen. God bless you all, and thank you all for worshiping with us on tonight. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Thank you, Brother Felton, Brother Jay, thank you all for coming in. Thank you, Longley, thank you all. Yeah, y'all shout out my media department, took care of us, Brother Jeremy. So I cherish the old Grace and peace be unto all of you. You'll touch three people or just look at three people and say, may his peace be with you. May his peace be with you. And may his peace be with you. God bless you all. Thank you. Till my joy is at last I lay down. Picture, picture, Felicia. Some 